The logic of hypothesis testing is a specific application of decision theory, and it gives a normative or prescriptive idea of optimal decisions under uncertainty. In this case, we have considerable uncertainty. We don't know, on the basis of our small samples, whether what we're assuming is true in the population is actually accurate. Notice, in order to never be wrong, we would have to measure an entire population. That's not possible in most cases. So, we're going to be taking a small sample and making a decision between whether it's sampling error alone causing the difference that we obtained, or whether whatever we did to our sample actually had an effect. So we need to be specific and we need to be careful in how we make decisions from these noisy data. Now, all hypothesis testing starts with a hypothesis test. And a hypothesis test is a statistical method that uses sample data to evaluate a hypothesis about a population. So our hypothesis test is really a set of rules that if scientists follow, we can be optimal in our decisions. Now we're going to use the same context we had before, our population of IQ, where we took a sample and applied a treatment and obtained sample statistics. But let's step through more formally our set of processes about forming an evaluation of our hypothesis that our treatment had an effect. Now hypothesis tests can be laid out in several different steps. We're gonna lay it out in four for this module. First, we always form a statistical hypothesis. In fact, we're going to have multiple hypotheses and we're going to decide between competing ones. Next, we're going to make predictions about what we should obtain and establish a standard of evidence. This is a very important step. We must establish what our standard of evidence is before we see data. In part, this is to keep us honest and in part, it's to keep science free from bad results. Next, we're going to test our hypotheses by collecting data and forming what we'll know as a test statistic. Finally, we'll make an evaluation on the basis of what we obtain. That is, do we think our first explanation, that is, sampling error alone caused the difference, is reasonable? Our whole point in doing this is to discredit that first explanation, to say that it is unreasonable that sampling error alone is the explanation for whatever effect we obtain. Let's begin by forming our statistical hypotheses. Now, statistical hypotheses come in two varieties, the null hypothesis, also known as H sub zero, and the alternative hypothesis, known as H sub one. The null hypothesis states something very specific, that in the population, there is no change, no difference, or no relationship for whatever we're measuring. For an experiment, this is akin to saying there is no effect of the treatment we applied. So notice that this makes a specific statement that whatever difference we obtain or observe is due to sampling error only. Remember, this is the same thing as that sampling error only explanation. We've just given it a name. And the null hypothesis has a very critical place in science. It is the explanation we are obligated to use if it is reasonable. Because notice, this is the most parsimonious explanation we can have for any difference obtained. Because this explanation makes no statement about anything else happening in the world other than something we know will always happen in the world. Sampling error is always going to happen when we take a sample from a population. Our sample statistics will not match the population parameter. So sampling error will always be a part of any measurement we make. So the null hypothesis says that whatever difference we obtain is simply that sampling error we know will always be there. Now let's take a step back and think about why we should be obligated to use the null hypothesis if it is reasonable. This goes back to a 14th century Franciscan friar, William of Ockham, who said, entia non suit multiplicanda pater necessitatum, or entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. Many of you know this as Ockham's razor, and a razor in philosophy is simply a method for deciding between competing explanations. This razor says that we have an obligation to parsimony, that if there is a simple explanation that requires no other stipulations about the world, then we should use that explanation because it simply is the most parsimonious. It says, in essence, that we should use the simplest explanation as long as it can reasonably account for whatever we have observed. 
So the null hypothesis is a very special thing in science. It is simply an instantiation of this razor that we should use it if it is reasonable. So our purpose as scientists is to discredit the null hypothesis, to say in some way that the null hypothesis isn't reasonable, that whatever difference we obtain isn't reasonably attributable to sampling error alone. Now, on the other hand, the competing explanation to the null hypothesis is the alternative hypothesis, or H sub 1. This states that in the population, there is a change, is a difference, or is a relationship. For an experiment, this means an effect of treatment. The alternative hypothesis can also be thought of saying that the difference we observe is due to sampling error, which we know will always be there, plus some real effect. So, the alternative hypothesis is what we as scientists, if we're doing some type of study, usually want to show is a better explanation. And remember, to do this, we're going to have to discredit the null hypothesis, because believing the alternative hypothesis will add some entity to the world. That is, we will be adding to our explanation something other than just sampling error. And given our preference for parsimonious explanations in the world, we will need some amount of evidence in order to discredit that null hypothesis before we can start believing the alternative hypothesis is true.